All right, let's do another one. Fuck it. Get the devil mode on this bitch. No, but I'm going to do something a little different here. I've been making reaction videos, which I love. But right now, if my phone will quit from fucking up all the time, I'm going to do something different. I'm just going to Google search some random Tulsa, Oklahoma mysteries. Because I live in Tulsa and I'm curious. How y'all doing? Hopefully y'all enjoy these videos I'm starting to put out. I know they're not the best quality, but they're getting better. So, this category is going to be called Google Searches. Random Google Search Mysteries. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that sounds better. Now, I might have to uh, lock my screen and unlock it quite a few times in this video. Well, maybe not, but probably because it's a piece of shit and it likes to creep up so fuck it let's get it you what i'm saying always good to get shit all right let's get it you ready make sure i still recording yeah i'm good okay six unsolved mysteries in oklahoma i said tulsa fucker but let's read Well, intriguing unsolved mysteries are a nightmare for those loved ones left behind and the detectives dedicated to solving them. Sometimes it's new forensic evidence, and other times it's simple as re examining clues that lead you to a cold case being solved. You never know, you might be able to help classify these cases as solved once and for all. Number one Shannon Baldwin Hawkinson, Enid, 2012. Shannon, a mother of three, was last heard from in October. What the fuck did I just say October for? Sorry, guys. In May 2012, but was not reported missing until August 7th, 2012. And that's a long time to not notice someone's missing or report them. I mean, like, I'm just saying, if my family don't answer the phone the first time, like, I'm calling 20 more times, then I'm calling the cops. That's a little drastic, but, I mean, you know, that's a long time. I mean, June, July, August, that's three months. Anyway, she stopped responding to family and friends in the spring of 2012. Holy hell. What the hell? That was all the way in the spring. Police received a few tips of the whereabouts of her body. What the hell? But the tips only led them to a dead end, so who's to say she's dead? Detectives believe she is the victim of foul play and continue their investigation case. That is not very much information. Uh, let's go ahead and see if we can find some more about the Shannon Hawkinson. What I'll do is I'll read through all these and then I'll do their own video on each person. How's that sound? with all the information I can find. This is just gonna cover six topics we're gonna cover in this series. The six people. Ah! Sorry. <clears throat> oh, the Girl Scout murders. Now we've heard of all, we've all heard of the Girl Scout murders. It's been covered numerous times in YouTube and, and on here. So, I'm gonna do it too. Firkin. So we got Doris Milner, Lori Farmer, and Michelle Gus, or Gus, I don't know how to say that, but may your soul rest in peace. Hold up, I know how to do this. Freaking phone freeze is bad. The horrific crime happened on June 13th of 77 at Camp Scott in Mays County. It was the first night of Girl Scout camp when three young girls were killed and sexually molested. The girls were 8, 9, and 10, and were murdered sometime between 2 and 4 in the morning. Ironically, it's 3.49 right now. They were murdered in their tent and carried about 150 yards from it. At about 6 o'clock in the morning, 
A camp counselor was walking along the trail to take a shower because she smelled. She really needed a shower. And when she discovered the bodies on the side of the trail, man, that's horrible. Going these bodies, like, it's, it's, it's sad. There was a man, and I believe his name was, like, Eugene Scott, or, I, I don't know what his name was. I just know it was Eugene something. And I will find out more about him when we go into each individual one. But, he was tried. <sighs> They tried him, and he was um, acquitted, which is bullshit, because you know what? I felt like he did it. I mean, he was a convicted sex offender. He had a lot of charges for other stuff, I think. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I mean, honestly, I feel like he did it, but, you know. New DNA tests were found to be inconclusive since the evidence was too old. It wasn't stored properly. I mean, obviously. Next, number three, Paul Ivy George, Manchester. I didn't know there was a Manchester in Oklahoma. Paula Ivy George, a 44-year-old woman, was shot to death in her home on April 30th, 2013. Somebody shot her from her porch through a window into her bedroom. Damn, that's some good aim. And that that's always been a fear of mine, a really big fear of mine. Like... Because we don't ever know who's always, like, looking in our windows. <sighs> Shit! Fuck! Sorry, I got the yawns tonight. We don't ever know who's looking in our windows. I mean, it's scary to think about. Uh, Paula's home was located at a busy intersection in Manchester, and police believe someone had to have witnessed her murder. Mm, not necessarily, because a lot of people don't look around thinking the murder's gonna happen, you know. Nobody's came forward with any information yet, though. Nancy Probst. Number four. Sorry. Nancy Probst, or Probst, Midwest City, 2000. The case of Nancy Probst, Probst, I don't know, murder still remains unsolved. In the daylight hours back in November of 2000, Nancy was beaten and shot to death while her nine-month-old baby was in the room next to hers. Her cheating husband was not home. Why did they put that like that? Do they think he did it? Like, they straight up say her cheating husband. Why is that one piece of information relative? I mean, unless they're trying to incriminate him. I don't know, but... I mean, if he is, good, but... You know what I'm saying. Okay, so her cheating husband was not at home at the time and saw her body through a window. Before entering the home, he called police and waited down the street for them to arrive. He was the prime suspect and was held in jail for 13 months before the judge ruled there was not enough evidence to convict him. <laughs> there was not enough evidence to convict him. There had been other break-ins in the neighborhood, and some other women were sexually assaulted. Nancy's body was not sexually assaulted. That's how you know it was the husband. He, 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 he had sex with her all the time. He didn't want to do it anymore. So her uh, crime did not follow the pattern of the others. Police are retesting unknown DNA that was found at the crime scene. Yeah, we'll, we'll touch base on that in episode four. Laura Bible, or Loria, this is Loria, but I thought it was Laura, I, I don't know, Loria Bible and Ashley Freeman Welch, now this is a sad case too, 1999, these were very young girls, and it's, it's, it's sad, no one knows for sure what exactly happened to Loria Bible and Ashley Freeman on December 30th of 1999, they were staying the night at the Freeman's mobile home, and sometimes during the early morning hours, it caught fire. Some bitch caught on fire. Just, just whoosh. And out of nowhere, it's kind of strange, you know, unless someone was like, you know, <laughs> hitting the pipe or something, or, you know, smoking a little cigarette and fell asleep because it was high on hair on or something. You never know. But the house caught on fire. And, uh, Miss Freeman's body burned. They died. Mr. and Mrs. Freeman died in the home. Inside. Burn up. Dead. Um, 
Miss Freeman's body was found in the mobile home, but Mr. Freeman and, and the two girls were not found. Oh, I didn't know Mr. Freeman wasn't found. Well, he was not found. That's shocking as fuck. Oh, oh, okay. A day, okay, okay. A day later, Mr. Freeman was found shot in the head. His wife has also been shot in the head. Now, I didn't know that. I did not know that, and you know what that reminds me of? I think that's a murder-suicide. I think he killed his wife, burnt the bitch to the ground, took the girls somewhere, killed and disposed of them, or gave them away, or something. Probably killed and got rid of the bodies because they would have been identified by now, probably, if they were still here. And if I had to guess, I'd say he shot himself. Who's to say? I don't know. He had been shot in the head prior to the fire. No trace of Gloria or Ashley has ever been found. A few men did confess, but the confessions were proven false. I don't know why anybody would ever confess something they didn't do. Fuck that shit. Not even for attention. The case still remains unsolved. And this one, this is a personal case to me. Brittany Phillips case. Um, my, my grandfather was in a writing class because he loved writing. Back when I was like 10 years old, when I was young, I'm 24 now, and he was lying here, and he was in a writing class with her mother. Her mother goes around um, with a with a van that's got posters of her daughter asking what happened, who's the killer, find the killer, whatever, all around the nation. It's kind of sad. There's, there's a case, he, and then there's an extra name that I'm going to throw into this. Oh, it's another, it's another Tulsa case that needs to be solved. We need to figure something out with this. And it's not mentioned on this list, but I'm going to mention it myself. And that is the case of, um, Tina Pitts. Tina Pitts. She, she went missing. Or, and, and blood was found in her boyfriend's truck. But he was never questioned or never arrested or something. I don't know. But she's never been found either. Her body's never been found. Tina Pitts. She was a mother. Her son's on Facebook, actually. When her stuff comes up, he, he still comments on it. It's horribly sad. But anyway. Brittany Phillips was an 18-year-old college student. She was found dead in her Tulsa, Oklahoma apartment on September 30th, 2004. She was raped and strangled, probably dead for a few days before her body was found. And that's, again, if my family don't answer the damn phone, I'm going to their house like, I don't get it. DNA was found at the crime scene, but it hasn't matched any of the suspects or any of the other 3,000 samples that have been tested against. Brittany's mother is still actively seeking justice for her daughter. She's driven hundreds of thousands of miles in her car that has been wrapped with photos of Brittany. Hoping to bring awareness to this decade-long case. Unfortunately, Oklahoma has many unsolved cases still in place. So if you have any of these, any information about any of these cases, it'd be nice. Go ahead and call your local police department. Uh, even if you don't live in the same city. Crime Stoppers. I mean, uh, you know, just, just, just call if you need it. Let's go back and see what's going on. We're still looking at Unsolved Mysteries. Hey, Unsolved Mysteries came to Tulsa. The actual show. Oklahoma City. Now, this is interesting. Unsolved Mysteries comes to Tulsa, or comes to Oklahoma, June 70th. Did I just fucking say that, you dumb imbecile? June 7th, 1990. Oh, Fuck, clicked on something, my bad. June 70th. God damn it, you dumb fuck, shut God, you're an idiot. June 7th, 1990. The case of a mysterious brown pinto. Not the bean, the car. And the 18... God damn it, I fucked it up again. Yeah, I'm a dummy. The 1988 murder of Joplin Trucker on the Turner Turnpike. Have lured... The television show Unsolved Mysteries to Oklahoma, which is a filming a reenactment of the crime this week. 
The Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation hopes the show, which airs at 7 p.m. Wednesdays on KJRH Channel 2, will help the Bureau solve the November 12, 1988 shooting death of Dwayne Morkendale McCorkendale. Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation spokesman Paul Renfro said, We'll get 25 million to 30 million viewers. Renfro said, This is like a miniature movie. Tim Rogan, Unsolved Mysteries field producer, said, One reason the crime interested the producers was the pinto, which has never been found. Really? After McCorkendale's death, many other truckers started reporting a brown pinto with Oklahoma plates that was harassing them cutting them off on highways. Really? Another reason that uh, Unsolved Mysteries decided to do the reenactment was this is a chance to tell the story about a group of people, truckers, who are not usually shown in a good light. That's true. Some of them are assholes. But, McCorkendale was a favorite thing, not looking for trouble. The entire production may cost between $150,000 and $200,000 and will include a stunt driver for highway scenes and it should air sometime this fall and that's back in 1990 filming centers around the rest area of the Turner Turnpike near Chandler where McCorkendale stopped the night of November 12, 1988 as was his routine Rimfro said I'm gonna, start, I'm gonna call him MC because that's a long last name Renfro said MC often drove from Joplin to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City, to make deliveries to General Motors. On his way back to Joplin, he always stopped at that exact rest area, the exact one, to take a piss, to call and to call his wife and the GM plant. MC was also an avid Citizens Band radiator, radio user. Sorry. OSBI agents believe he was talking on the CB about stopping at the rest area and someone either followed him there or was waiting for him. MC got out of his truck and he was shot once in the back. The bullet pierced through his heart and he died. Man. Man. Renfro said the OSB, OSBI believes the killer stole 25 bucks. That's it. Wow. From MC. Said. Shortly after the murder, the OSBI began receiving reports about a brown pinto with a black man and a white man inside. Wow, two colored people that you never see, black people and white people. And equipped with a CB antenna that was menacing trucks. I guarantee you that had something to do with it. Renfro said that the pinto was pulling in close to the trucks and cutting them off. When the truckers got on the CB to tell them to knock it off, the Pinto's occupants would say, We'll do, we'll do to you what we did to the other trucker. And that's fucked. OSBI agents first sought the help of the national media shortly after the crime occurred, when they were having a really difficult time solving the murder, and obviously they still are. They placed ads in national trucker magazines asking for any information about the shooting and the death of Duane McCorkendale. Or the Brown Pinto. Ten reports in six states of the Pinto with Oklahoma plates. Wow. Either trying to run trucks off the road or of the Pinto's occupants acting suspiciously at rest stops. The OSBI didn't stop with the magazine ads. It took the case to Unsolved Mysteries last summer after an... O Not last summer, like 20... Frickin' 18 summer, 19 summer. 1990 at Oklahoma City Television Station, and they did a feature on the crime, which is great. I'm glad they did. I, I'm very curious about it. I mean, you know, I mean, honestly, I mean, it's it's sad, man. Um, they killed that guy, man. He didn't deserve to die, you know? And, and, and the Pinto story, that's crazy. So they got in his car, or they were in a car. They were in a Pinto, and they went to six different states fucking with people. Let me see if I can find some, some, some more older ones, or maybe some more interesting ones. This one's on Wiki, I think, or something. I just want to see. 
Oh, okay, okay, okay. Here's one. Michael Wayne Brown. We got a few of them. Let's see what we got. Wow, what is this? Oh, these are... What? Prison escapees? I, I guess these are prison escapees. Michael Wayne Brown. Alias is Donut. Wanted for escape. And he's been gone since 84. Wow! In 1974, 18-year-old Michael Wayne Brown and a friend robbed an insurance office in Oklahoma and murdered Richard Solder, an insurance investigator who arrived in the office during the robbery. Two men were eventually arrested, tried, and convicted of the murder, and Brown was sentenced to death. The sentence was commuted to life in prison. He was like, fuck that, dude, I'm out. He was like, fuck that shit, I'm out, even though this shit ain't came out, yeah. In 1983, a widow named Donna Moses met Brown through a program in her church, where they talked to prisoners at a nearby correctional facility. The two fell in love, and in 84, they got married. On December 3rd, just a few months later, Michael Wayne Brown and another inmate escaped from Just Done Correctional Center in Taft, Taft, Taft Oklahoma. And uh, authorities assumed that Donna had driven the getaway car after she dropped her two children off with relatives. What a freaking B. Richard Sullivan. Man, that's 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 sad. They killed him. Donna vanished just one day before her daughter Sherry Nickerson's 15th birthday. The Browns, using the alias David and Sherry Gregory, were tracked down to New Jersey in 87. Wow. Donna called Sherry to tell her that she had split up with Brown and that she would return soon, but she never did. She might have died. I bet he killed her. Donna called Sherry and her brother again in 90 or 91, and she asked if she had any grandchildren, but at that time she didn't. However, since, Sherry and her brother have each had a son, and they want their children to meet their long-lost grandmother. Grandmother. Authorities believe that Donna is afraid to come home because of her involvement in the escape. However, there are no warrants out for her, and she is allowed to come home at any time. Now, Michael Wayne Brown, he's still gone, and he's still wanted for escape. Now, there are some extra notes on this, and it's the first case aired April 10th of 98 in Unsolved Mysteries. It was also featured on I Almost Got Away With It. This is not the Michael Wayne Brown from Moncton, New Brunswick, in Canada. He's still missing. Results. Captured. Really? After nearly 14 and a half years on the run, Brown surrendered to authorities while working in Kettering, Ohio, in a video store under the name Kenneth Ginder. Going on the run after fewer recognized him from the Unsolved Mysteries segment, he returned to prison to finish his sentence. And Donna wasn't prosecuted. Well, I'll be damned. That piece of shit. Shit, bitch. No, but she did help him escape, and, and you know, if you're gonna help somebody escape, you better at least not be a bitch. God dang it, I'm still looking at this. Here we go. Here's one on Ranker. It's a Ranker list. It's gotta be a good one. Oklahoma has some especially alarming unsolved mysteries. Whether cold cases or open investigations that leave everyone stumped, these crimes are both chilling and tragic. Horrific crimes like kidnapping, abductions, taking kids from other people that, you know, they're not yours. Yeah, they kidnap me. Murder, killing, slaying, homicide. Death by someone else's hand. Murder. Through gain a layer of mystery, though, not through, though gain a layer of mystery when the killer remains at large. Many unsolved Oklahoma murders appear on television shows like Unsolved Mysteries or circulate as stories among true crime enthusiasts. People losing their life is always tragic, but perhaps spreading their stories will help authorities discover clues and bring the victim's family's closure. I agree. What is this? An unknown assailant murdered three Girl Scouts at summer camp. Well, no, we know that. But there's that that picture I was telling you about, about Eugene Hart, or whatever his name was. What is his name? Let me see if it's got a name. Leroy Hart. Gene Leroy Hart. I thought so. I was close. That's him. 
The guy I was telling you about it, the girls got murdered. I mean, let's get through that because we already know that. Oh. Wow, well, a hunter found the bodies of the James Berry family buried in the woods. I didn't know they were buried. In October two, 2009, Ufala residents Bobby and Shara Lynn Jameson, along with their six-year-old daughter Madison, disappeared. The family spent their last moments traveling about 30 minutes from their home in Red, Red Oak Oak Mountain Range, where they planned to check out 40 acres of land. Several days later, after the police began investigating the missing family, they located the Jameson's damn truck. Let me tell you what, if I'd have found that truck and I'd have got in it, there wouldn't have been no $32,000 in cash. I promise you that. I ain't a bad guy, but damn, man, 32 k you just left it. Anyway, undamaged and abandoned in the woods with the doors locked. Why is it in the woods? Inside, the police found their malnourished dog. He was skinny. Along with the family's cell phones, wallets, IDs, and $32,000 cash. Four years later, hunters discovered the remains of a child and two adults lying face down next to one another. But the forensic testing didn't positively identify the remains as Jameson's until six months later. Numerous theories exist about what happened to the family. One possessed a murder-suicide. Well, another suggests that a murder at the hands of Bobby's father, who allegedly had an unstable relationship with the family. Additionally, police discovered a long, angry letter that Sherilyn wrote to Bobby and couldn't uncover the pistol she owned. Because the family was carrying a large sum of cash, some think they were, might have been involved in drugs. No, 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 drugs are bad. A local pastor revealed Bobby once sought some advice about an alleged haunting in his home. Bobby and Cheryl Lynn may have believed in the occult. She owned a witch's Bible, though she claimed it was only a joke. The night the Jamesons left, home security footage recorded them loading items into their truck like in a trance-like state. I don't know what to think about that. And here's a mystery. Here's something a little different. Joanne Gay Croft her name. She vanished after a devastating tornado. So, it's a different, this ain't no murder, it's something different, I, I guess. A massive F5 tornado ripped through Woodward, Oklahoma on April 9th, 1947. It became the state's deadliest tornado after it injured over 1,000 people and killed 185. Damn. Four-year-old Joanne Gaycroft lost her mother in the tragedy, and her stepfather suffered serious injuries. Joanne, meanwhile, ended up in a hospital when a piece of wood pierced her leg, while her sister sustained minor injuries. As Joanne and her sister recuperated in a hospital basement room, two men in khaki-colored military outfits entered the room and took them with them, while it took her. Joanne didn't want to leave her sister, and when the staff tried to intervene, the men claimed they were taking her to another hospital. No one ever saw her again. What the hell? A large-scale manhunt for both Joanne and her kidnappers failed to turn up any clues of what happened to the little girl. Since the incident, many women have claimed to be Joanne, including one who believes she remembered the aftermath of the tornado while under hypnosis. The woman saw an episode of U.M. Unsolved Mysteries that led her to think she might be the missing girl. A scar on her leg vertically was her story, but blood tests proved she wasn't Joanne. That's sad. You now we've seen that one. I've already seen that one. You know, I just read that one. Um. Okay, here we go. Aileen, Aileen Conway passed away in a car crash, but evidence suggests foul play. When a farmer noticed smoke rising from a nearby road on the morning of April 29th, 86, he immediately called the police. Authorities arrived at the scene to find a flaming car burning so hot the car had melted to the guardrail. Wow. They identified the vehicle's owner as Pat Conway, and a few days later, the occupant 
what they said was his wife, Aileen Conway. Skid marks at the scene led police to label Aileen's death an accident, but several strange details caused Pat to believe someone murdered his wife. The day Aileen died, Pat found the patio door wide open, the iron on, and the garden hose were running. Aileen failed to take her purse, her glasses, or her driver's license. She also left the phone off the hood and water in the bathtub because he also didn't understand why Aileen would be driving on the road unknown to both of them. Pat contracted the investigator and they visited the crash site. They discovered a bulletin from the Conway's church on the side of the road that Pat remembered seeing on the car's dashboard. I didn't know that was in Oklahoma. Heard the story before I'm criminally listed. I didn't know it was no mother. Aileen never drove with the windows open. Finally, arson experts got involved. They discovered the car's gas cap was missing, consistent with arson cases. They also determined someone likely doused the inside of the vehicle with gas. Investigators have never identified a possible suspect or motive for the murder. A man murdered a Jane Doe baby seconds after its birth. Wonder why. A deer hunter scouting an area in McIntosh County in November 91 heard a woman's screams from across the river. He saw a man hitting something. The assailant then grabbed a woman, dragged her to a vehicle, and drove away from the scene. After they left, the hunter approached the area and discovered a deceased newborn in a plastic bag. That's fucked. They should have killed him from that point. Coroners determined that the woman gave birth only seconds before the male companion beat the infant to death, the little bastard. Not the kid, the dad, the, the, the guy. Despite officer efforts, no one possessed any information about the woman's identity and the case went cold. But it tragically affected the town, I mean, dude, look, y'all beat a little kid, that's fucked. They raised money to hold a funeral for the baby. DNA, DNA evidence finally helped authorities discover the mother's identity. And the authorities arrested Penny Anita Lowry. No, not good. She confessed to her part in the child's death, but refused to name her male companion. In 2010, Lowry pled guilty to a lesser charge of first-degree accessory to murder and received a 45-year sentence. The identity of a male, the man she's scared to even say who it is. Now, the Oklahoma City butcher that dismembered three women. This is going to be the last one. Three utility workers discovered the Oklahoma City Butcher's first known victim inside an abandoned house. April 1st, 76, the perpetrator placed Kathy Lynn Shackelford's head into a popcorn bucket. Wow. Police also found her leg and torso inside the house. It took nearly two decades, 20 fucking years, to identify her via DNA testing. Three years later, a group of children playing basketball Notice a dog carrying a human head. Ain't that a fuck? Is that not a fuck or what? A dog running down the street but a kid with a head. The killer cut up his victim identified as Arlie Killian and scattered her body parts around the area. He wrapped them in paper bags or newspaper and placed them around town. March 6th of 86. Two people separately discovered body parts belonging to Tina Sanders. Police reasoned that the OKC butcher had struck again. The killer had apparently disappeared after the accident, but authorities realized all three victims were Native American heritage, possibly possessed connections to sex work. They also noted the killer supposedly placed his women's body parts where passerbys would find them, and dismembered the remains never included the victim's sexual organs. They figured out who the butcher was. His name was Henry Lee Lucas. A serial killer eventually convicting of killing 11 people. Wow. As a suspect in Killian's case, they never made an arrest for any of the women's murders. Really? That's fucked. Yeah, we've seen this one. I'm going to read this one too as a bonus. In 1980, April 80, a group of fishermen discovered the body of a young woman left alongside a river near Jones, Oklahoma. The killer shot her in the chest three times and likely dumped her body by the river. Then he covered the body with quick lime, thinking it would hasten decomposition. 
The burnt lime preserved the woman's body, however, so the police were able to see her bullet wounds. Get a basic idea of her facial features and make out a small heart tattoo on her chest. The unknown lady became known as the Lime Lady. DNA evidence is yet to identify the woman. Authorities suspect she is likely an orphan or a foster child. Does no one ever report they're missing or anything? They buried her body in an Oklahoma City cemetery until the police can uh, uncover the identity of the woman. Nothing can be done, apparently. This one was pretty interesting. I'll go ahead and have, give you two bonuses. Fuck it. Uh, Leonard, or Leonard Dierickson, disappeared with a man wanting to purchase his horse. On March 14th, 98, a man in a white pickup truck paid Leonard Dixon Dirickson, whatever, and his 19-year-old son, Jared, a visit, visit at their farm outside of Cheyenne. Leonard spoke with the man for a while, out of earshot of his son, and told Jared he was taking the man to look at one of the horses. Witnesses later saw Leonard and the man at a local coffee house. Leonard never returned home. The police investigation turned up no sign of Leonard. And though he was in the process of a divorce and struggling with his finances, Jared doesn't believe that his father chose to leave. No, no, he wouldn't do that. I mean, dad, was, dad and mama split, but they were still banging, and he wouldn't leave. Jared doesn't believe his father chose to leave. No one discovered Leonard's body. However, the police found no evidence of foul play. Authorities received an anonymous tip about six months later after Leonard's disappearance, disappearance that he was in a Texas bar. But when they arrived, both men and the informant were gone. That, that, that's nice. I mean, that's, that's, that's it, guys. I'm tired of reading. But, yeah, that was uh, the very first series of just random Google searches. I'm going to call this series Google Search Mysteries. Uh, I'll do this series. Let me write it down. I need to remember what I'm going to start doing this series. So I don't forget. Google search mysteries. We're going to do those every today, which is technically Saturday, but we'll do them on Friday nights. Every Friday nights. If you guys enjoyed that, um, like I said, the videos will get better. I'm working on my editing skills now. I'm going to um, start putting out videos with an intro. For you too. I've got an intro and I'll be making better thumbnails too. Um, I'm learning those apps. I've got the uh, oh, what is it, Kinemaster or something like that. I'm learning it right now. And uh, but yeah, so every Friday, get ready. Google search mysteries because we're gonna keep doing them. But anyway, y'all have a good. I gotta get this uploaded. Y'all have a good night. Thank you for tuning into Suspense TV. You know, I'm going to change my name to Suspense TV because I'm Spencer. And y'all have a good night. See y'all next time. See y'all tomorrow. We're going to do another Pop Squad reaction tomorrow. I promise. Buddy that's with YouTube, good night.